Hey, everybody. I hope you guys are having a splendid day. My name is Sean Pitcher. I am your host of Roots Podcast. Um, today, we have a very special guest on. This is Dr. Donation. She's the professor and dean of the School of the Professions at SUNY Buffalo State University. Um, she's one of my mentors. I had her when I was an undergrad in college. Um, she definitely helped me on my path towards sports nutrition. I didn't have any clue that that was something that was going to be available to me when I was going into undergrad. Um, a lot of times, and we'll talk about this more, but when you go into dietetics nutrition, a lot of times you just think that there's a clinical route, but there's a lot of different paths that kind of come off of that. Um, but before we get into that, Dr. D, if you could just give us a little bit of the roots behind who you are, that would be fantastic to start. Thank you, Sean. That was quite an introduction. And, and I remember all those years ago when you were a fabulous student. So it's been a pleasure. <laughs> In my career, basically, I, as a dietitian, I really loved working with people. I liked working one on one. I like medical nutrition therapy, but I also saw a bigger need in community nutrition and public health. And because I have such a strong background in biology and I saw what was going on in with the health of communities all over, I decided to get my master's in public health nutrition. So that's, I went and got my master's degree and utilized that many, many, many times throughout my career. It's been a beautiful addition to being a registered dietitian. And then when I, started teaching people and teaching communities. I'm big into physical activity, and I believe that you can't unmarry nutrition and physical activity. So I decided I'm going to jump into getting my PhD in exercise science. And that's when I went and pursued that pathway. And very glad I did because it was a very unique combination. Having the nutrition background, the, the master's in public health, and the PhD in exercise science opened up a lot of doors. One of the doors that opened up was teaching at the higher ed level, and I loved it. I loved teaching students that were really interested in learning a lifelong skill. So I began at the University of Buffalo. Then I started here at Buffalo State College. I went through the ranks of assistant to associate to full professor. And then I became a department chair in the meantime and loved it. And now I'm dean of the, the college or school of professions and loving the opportunity to help faculty make things better for students and charter the way for students to get a career that they love. And that's one of my biggest goals is if they can find a career that they don't think is work, I've done my, our job. And, and I'm, I'm proof right here to tell everybody yes. I go on every day. Yeah. I enjoy myself. I don't feel like it's super stressful. Like it's a nice, relaxed environment and it's, it's energizing to be in that environment every single day. I don't feel like I'm having to drag myself to work. And that's probably literally case in point, exactly what she's hoping for a majority of her students to come it's, out. With. Exactly. And sometimes the road to get there can be very cumbersome, but it's worth it. Yeah. And I can say firsthand, the standard, I would say the toughest education I had was at Buffalo State. The standard that those professors that I had there was harder than my master's and probably even harder than the one year of, of doctoral work that I took at when I was at Ole Miss as well. Um, they day in, day out, made sure you knew your information, made sure you studied, um, were asking you questions, like we're always giving you constructive criticism and feedback. They wanted to make sure that you were as prepared as possible so whatever position you were going to go into, no matter what the obstacle was, you at least had the base level tools in your toolbox to be able to handle those things. And that's exactly. helped me square one from when I was there and definitely carried me amongst kind of where I am today as well. So that helped it a lot. I'm glad. That's great. So one of the things I wanted to touch on specifically is, you know, a lot of times when we hear podcasts, you know, everyone talks about their journey, the universities they've been at, the places they've worked at, but not a lot of people talk about the path from high school to college, or in this case, if we're talking about dietetics is how do I go from high school and find out that there is a path in dietetics nutrition, or where do I go to figure out like where those paths are available to me? Could you kind of expand and talk about that a little bit? Um, and then one more thing off of that is when I was there in the coordinator program, we also had a lot of people that had second careers right? That also came in their first undergrad didn't work out. Maybe they weren't making the income they wanted. Maybe they fell out of love with it. So then they came into 
nutrition as a second career just because they kind of stumbled upon it. Yeah. And, and case in point, I my first idea of my job was not to become a registered dietitian. I stumbled upon it. I was at university and I had an opportunity to take an elective. I was in a biology track in my senior year, I took an elective. And you know, as you go through higher ed and especially undergrad and all of a sudden you see the finish line and then you go, ooh, did I pick the right path? Do I wanna wear a lab coat in a, in a lab somewhere? <laughs> and it, I started to question myself. However, I was ready to pursue that and find where I would land. But in the meantime, I took an elective in nutrition and like by the second class, I'm like, oh, okay, this is, this is very fun for me. I love it. I'm learning things. I can talk to my friends about it. I can talk to my family about it. So that launched me. Of course, I, I, fin I graduated, but then I had to go on further because Ascend requires further courses that, that you would need. But all those extra courses that I took, I, I loved them. I remember coming back to, you know, from class and just sitting there going, I can't wait to start learning this. And it, it really worked out well. And, and that's when the door open because I'm in, in a group and I have professors and instructors that are in the field and they would mention different opportunities of where I could go. And I realized how I basically tell people if there's food at all as a possibility linked with something, yep. you can find your job, right? Whether you're talking about preschool, whether you're talking about Head Start, whether you're talking about college level, retirement homes, et cetera. And I literally jumped into the field and not really had to look for a job because when you're enthusiastic and you love what you do, people would start to say, hey, Carol, there's a job opening so-and-so, are you interested? The two things I learned, if you're enthusiastic, you're qualified, you probably don't have to look for a job. So what does that tell you? It means you have to keep your resume updated on a daily or weekly basis. Don't scramble at the ninth hour to, you know, get your resume up to speed because it's due at midnight. Yeah. The lesson I learned is I always kept my qualifications updated. Constantly being proactive. I mean, I'm sure <laughs> I was a little, I get this from my mother, but you can probably attest to this, but I remember there was times I get the syllabus and I'd have projects and papers done and I'd be coming to your guys' offices and I was like, hey, here, this is done. Can you just take it? Like, I'm done with it. And you'd be like, no, there's a date for this. You could hand it during this date, but excited yeah. that you got it done and it's over with for you. Congrats. <laughs> and, and I just told that to one of the students today. I'm like, if you get your projects at the beginning, start to don't wait till the it's due because by chance in, in higher ed, often a lot of projects are due at the end of the semester. Start looking at what you can get started earlier. And yeah, and even in your career, right? Don't wait to the ninth hour to get your report done for your supervisor. It just makes your life so much more stressful. Uh, and, and not only that, people would say, why do you always work a day ahead? I said, because then when a, an opportunity pops in unexpectedly, I can take it because I've already got what I needed to do for tomorrow done so I can take this opportunity. So there's a benefit, a hidden benefit for me. There, there's always a cost benefit ratio when it comes to it at the end of the day. Um, you mentioned community nutrition, sports nutrition, um, what what are like the different paths you can take in in dietetics and nutrition? You know, I know, I know obviously like I'm heavily that's where I, my field is sports nutrition. But what other paths can people take besides maybe just sports? Oh, and, you, and I always look at it that you you have to have a foundation. You have to learn medical nutrition therapy. So, so everybody has to learn about how the physiology of the body affects nutrition. It's it's important. And often people think, why do I have to learn this medical nutrition therapy clinical piece when I want to work in the community as a community educator? Well, the reason is for you to qualify as an expert in the field, you have to know all about it. And I always tell people by learning the medical nutrition therapy and going through your clinical rotation, you are now competent to go into community nutrition food service management, all these other areas that pop out from a clinical di uh, diet, dietitian, because those other avenues, it could be in marketing, it could be in product sales, 
Why is it that you need to know I'm in C? So that you're giving the right information. The message is solid and based and evidence-based rather than taking, looking at the web and seeing what is the current trend out there, right? Even if you're working in medical sales or you're a salesman or a marketer, you want to give quality product. And, and I could say we can agree on this is probably 90% of the stuff on the internet or social media is, is BS. It um, is. I, I did this. I can let, unless there's, go ahead. In working in the field, by the way, always go to the internet and see what's trending because 90% of your questions to you will be a <laughs> <laughs> that's a hundred percent fact <laughs> you can preempt what people are going to ask you yeah and it, it always seems like a lot of the trends just go in cycles like it could be happening this year disappear come back five years it's the same thing yes. or another company's trying to repackage it in a different way to sell it a different way but it's literally the same exact diet that's being refurbished every five to ten years it's like there's I, I, think, I think you said this too. There's no magic pill potion. There's nothing fancy that's going to get you there. It's like eating, sleeping, and hydrating are things you got to do every day. Right. You spend yeah. 10 to 15 hours a day doing it. So why not figure out how to excel at those three things? You know, not only let's say in my regard as an athlete, but maybe in a clinical setting for someone who has a disease state that if they don't change those behaviors and habits, well, they may not end up in the position that they want to long-term for their health. Agreed. That's well stated and so true. <laughs> and I think I, in my first class with every freshman class, I would say, here's the theory. If you want to get rich, create an outlandish diet book and people will buy it, right? So <laughs> there's no quick fix. There's no but someone fix. will expose you at the end of the day. Yeah. It's just, it's, exactly. it's not. It, it, it just goes. That's exactly what happens. It, it doesn't last and it's harmful if people do follow it. Yeah. So that's why I'm always saying like, if you're going to follow somebody on social media, somebody on the internet, like, do they have an RD and LD credentials? Like that's going to be the huge part. And if, if it is a PhD, because not all PhDs do nutrition classes, you can right. probably speak on that. I have several friends that are doctors as well that have never took a nutrition that's class right. out of their entirety of their time in school. And they're in school for a very long time. Yes. So you really got to do your groundwork, or at least spend a little bit of time looking through the article and ask yourself, like, is this actually credible? Or is this something someone's just throwing up there to get clicks and views and trying to get you to read it to follow something that's just not even within the norm? And, and Sean, really, the peer reviewed journal articles are the best source of information. Those are the articles that people submit. And it goes all across the country or internationally to experts in the field is blinded. So anything you put in there, they can look at it and indicate if it's valid or not. So peer reviewed journal articles are the best source. And the fun part is, is that sometimes medical doctors only get like a quarter of a semester in nutrition. So they rely heavily on registered dietitians. Oh yeah. Every doctor I know, I'm like, you better have a dietitian on staff or you better be That's referring right. to a dietitian. I go, cause unless you can explain this, this, and this, or these medical nutrition therapy issues, cause yeah. I mean, and a lot of times, right, like patients or individuals may get mad at doctors like, oh, they told me to follow this diet. And it's like if you have someone with 30 years of doing the same habits over and over and over and then you come in the yes. doctor's office and now all of a sudden you're telling them, like, I want you to follow a Mediterranean diet and then kick them out 10 minutes later. They're going to have zero clue what to do because they, they don't they don't even know how to go to bed on time or eat breakfast in the morning like bring water with them wherever they go. They don't even have basic level skills to be able to even transfer over to do something like yes. that. And what's really nice is the physicians and dentists now are starting to pair up and having dietitians come into their office a day a week or two days a week just to set up base there and see patients as they come and go. So it's kind of like the dietitian going to them in the doctor's office. So one-stop shopping. So now we're having more of a integrative approach with, yes. with multiple professionals and, and one area you're saying. Yes. And in dentists, dentists rely heavily on dietitians now, right? Because dental caries are often nutrition related, they're food related. And it's amazing that the oral health decline can really impact overall health later on in life. Yeah. Cause I'm sure maybe you can speak on this a little bit as well, but 
I'm sure that's going to directly affect your gut bacteria or your gut microbiome. Yeah. And then that's where your immune system lies. If your immune system doesn't have essentially a defense to help you yes. out when any of those things are coming in, then how are you going to really be able to fend stuff off? And you may think it's silly, but healthy gums prevent disease, right? Because they, they're a barrier for bacteria that we all consume bacteria in every day that we eat and your mouth is exposed to the outdoors. So if you have a healthy um, mouth, if your mouth is healthy, that barrier is stronger. So you have less of that infiltration by harmful bacteria. Yeah, it's, it's almost like you have two or three stops. Like, is this healthy? If not, it's going to come to the gut. If the gut's not healthy, yeah. it's going to go to the intestines. And then it's like, it's like an injury, right? Like if, if your ankle's messed up, it's going to go up the chain. Your knee's going to bother sure you, does. your back's going to bother you. And it could be, it could be vice versa there too, if you think about it in that aspect. And Sean, one of the other things that I love to tell people is that to be optimal in everything you do, like we all want to have more energy and we all want to do the best job we can. Sometimes you can't, you can't make that happen, but you can optimize the chances of it happening by eating right mm -hmm. and exercising and decreasing your disease risk because then your energy and the, your balance in your body feels so good that you do have the extra energy and you do have the confidence that I can take on that project or put my whole self into that project or run a marathon, whatever it is that you can do that because you feel good. And that's, that's what I found is the quickest buy-in like ever, everyone nowadays wants a quick fix. They want to like, what can you do for me? And like, how can I feel like an instant effect? And I think the first thing is energy. If you can change a person's energy and their energy is here, you can get it up to here. And now they can do something they couldn't do years ago. Right. They're bought in and they're probably going to ask more questions and come back for more help. And, and you know how when you're not feeling well and you're not feeling at your best, the things you do aren't as fun or you don't have the same outlook on them. But when you feel energetic and you feel healthy and you feel really good, Things that come your way and you think, oh, I can do that. Or, hey, that looks like fun. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't only affect you physically. It affects you mentally. I mentally. mean, and I'm, and I'm sure you've seen the rise in, you know, sports psychology or just psychologists in general. And more and more people are making mental health, you know, seen in the media and making it aware. And that, you know, even the, the biggest figures that we have out there, especially in sports, are coming out and saying, like, we're dealing with all the same issues that you are, but even at a higher level because of all the other stressors that are going to kind of, that are coming at us. But, you know, like I talk with, you know, our sports psychologists that we have on staff, like if, if this isn't thinking or this isn't in the right direction, anything that we do as a practitioner, good luck. It, it may, may not happen or may not get across until that portion of it is figured out that, so that we can start chipping away a little bit. Right. And, and getting the help, it, as you mentioned, it puts more tools in your toolbox, right? Because stress and anxiety is everywhere. How you manage that can be very important to reaching your potential. And the more you seek help and the more you recognize that you may need help, those tools are there for you the next time some situation occurs, I can better handle it. Yeah, because you're, you're, you're never going to get rid of physical and mental stress. No. Like it's, no. it's going to be there every single day, but what level can you get it to that is manageable and is it manageable for you to to be successful and be able to do your job or your sport or whatever it may be at a high level without impacting your direct life on and off and the other thing that i i feel is important to mention is i think you can react better to stress and anxiety if you have a well rested body right if you've gotten a good night's sleep but the 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 issue with people not getting enough sleep and then not eating right or consuming a frappuccino, sugar-laden, fat-laden breakfast, mm -hmm. they, they're setting themselves up for higher stress levels. It just all compiles on top of one another. I it mean, I, I, tell the, I tell the athletes, sleep is the cheat code. Sleep's going yeah. to determine everything that you're going to do going into the next day. Whether you get up in the morning, you're in a good yeah. mood, you have a good appetite, whether you even eat breakfast or not. And then if you don't eat breakfast, that's just going to keep pushing back your fueling timeline, push back your eating habits. And then that just becomes a spiral of events, um, sure. which, which for a lot of individuals, it's hard to turn back. I mean, going back to 
people that have done that for multiple years, it's hard for them to, yeah, I'm going to eat breakfast today. Well, I haven't eaten breakfast for the last 20 years. Why am I going to change now? <laughs> I call it muscle memory. You have to do it so often that after a while you don't think about it. It's just my, part of my routine now. But that initial getting to that point takes a lot of thought and takes a lot of discipline that yes, no matter how I feel, I don't want to do it. I'm going to do it. And, and finding where, like, where's the niche for you to swoop in to pinpoint what, like, are you doing it for you? Why do you want to do it? Is it going to help you? I mean, a lot of it now, especially with athletes is like making it their idea or putting it back on them. And like, you have to meet them halfway because just talking at them and telling them they're going to do something is, I mean, I'm sure it's for anybody, but it's, it's just not yeah. going to work. You got to be able to like take baby steps and make really, really small achievable goals that they're going to agree to do too. And there's a topic out there called motivational interviewing. It's a skill and it's really, you tell me what your goals are and you tell me what you think you can do to start those goals. The dietitian facilitates those conversations, right? Mm -hmm. But the person is the person that's buying in because they're helping set up those goals and motivational in interviewing can be so empowering that there's good success with that. And those who are listening to this, my brother and I did a podcast on motivational interviewing. He is a uh, licensed social worker. So if that's something you want to go back to, to listen to that, that'll be great to kind of pick up off of this discussion as well. Absolutely. Um, but again, we, I tell them all the time, I have the tools, I have the resources. I know several dietitians all over the country, college, pro level. Like I can reach out to a whole bunch of different people. If I don't know the answer, there's smarter people than me to get the answer, but I can give all this information to you, give you tips, tactics, protocols, routines. But if you don't flip the switch on and you don't want to do it, then it's all going to literally not going to go in the direction that we need to. You have to want to be able to push it to that point. And I think the in line with that and motivational interviewing is not setting the person for themselves will set such unman, unmanageable goals that they're not going to get there. So what happens when you don't get your goal, you don't reach it, you immediately feel rejected and you feel like I'm a failure and I can't do that again. Set a very tiny goal and just keep at it and then make it bigger and bigger. Yeah, it could be as easy as you know, if I have an athlete, can you bring a water bottle with you everywhere you go? Yeah. Can, can you go from eating zero snacks in the afternoon to eating three snacks next week? Yep. And most people hear that and they're like, well, that doesn't seem very hard. Well, again, back to the point, if you've never done it, you don't have value in it or it's not important to you. Yeah. That's going to be super hard because you never had to do that before. And now someone's pushing you and challenging you to do that. So Exactly. It'll tell you pretty quick if, if they can do something simple, then they'll probably be ready to progress towards some more challenging things. If they can't even bring a water bottle with them, no. then we're way far off from any of these lofty goals that they're probably talking about. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Accomplishing it step by step is very helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, since since I was there in college back and I was there 2010, 2015. Um, and I know sports nutrition was still kind of a small base and it has kind of exploded. Are, are you seeing more students with interest in that field? They're going towards that. Absolutely. Sean, you're my, you're my example for all these students, right? I always tell them about Sean, Sean, my student, Sean, Sean, this is where Sean is now, because I would say a good 15% of the students, you may not think that's a lot, but it's a lot mm -hmm. are Males, females that are first year, second year, third year, seniors, they, they want to go in that direction. And I tell them it's such an absolutely bursting field and career in dietetics right now. But it means you have to, you have to have a plan, I think. And I bring examples of you where you took opportunities. You were always taking opportunities that came along. Even if those weren't the opportunities you wanted to end with, you took those opportunities because it built your skill set, right? It built what you could converse in a job interview with because you had that experience. So it's not your ultimate goal, but because it's such a exploding field, you have to be aggressive. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. You have to be able to read on your own. You have to be able to make sure that you're making networks and contacts. And volunteering, right? I may not get paid to do this special project with athletes, but 
if I can do it, I'll do it. Yeah, because if you work hard and do a great job, right? Yeah. It, it only takes one opportunity, one chance for someone to say like, oh, I want to bring you on for a GA or a fellow position or like, yeah. oh, I know somebody at this school that like, I think you would do a really great job there and make a phone call. Like connections yeah, sure. mean everything. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, sports are huge, but they're also a very small collective world when it comes to a strength coach, a sports psychologist, yeah. a sports dietitian, right? Like everyone's going to have a branch onto their tree or in this case onto their roots that they're going to know somebody yeah. and you never want to burn a bridge because you never know how that's going to yeah. affect you down the road. True. And making those networks and, and maintaining those networks might be a little bit of work for you, mm-hmm. but I'm maintaining my network has helped me a lot in my career, right? If you get a network, if you get a contact, keep it going, foster it. And then if it's reached its potential, let it lay dormant, but then reinvigorate it again. Make sure you're doing that. And you can't do that if you're not going to take opportunities, right? You can't do that if you're going to work in a job that doesn't have those connections. And there's nothing wrong. Like, I know that some students take jobs that have nothing to do with nutrition because they pay more. I get it. I understand. But maybe you could volunteer or maybe you can do something in a position that is somewhat relative to your career to build those contacts. And I can tell you one thing, like my, my favorite subject in school was not food service, but guess what? I did multiple food service jobs working at restaurants yes. and you you know, now I'm in a position where we started from scratch. Right. And we, we just also inter, inter, introduced a, a new food service. Like it's never going to escape you. Like you're going to have to know yeah. things in multiple different categories that, are going to translate over in, in some way. Like and I was I, the same way. Yeah. I, I still go back to the, I, I think it was freshman year or sophomore year. You make every, every student do a public speaking class. I do. Yeah. And I still, and I still tell people, I was like, when I came in, I was frightened to talk in front of people like this yeah, would have never happened. Me yeah. talking to an athlete would have never happened, yeah. but having that exposure, you guys forcing, and I'm sure you guys still do making the athletes, do projects, speak in yes. front of people. Um, it's something you're going to have to do every single day is communicate with individuals. And if you're afraid, no matter what their personality is, if they're boisterous, if they're quiet, if if there's someone that you're probably not going to get along with just because of their personality, you have to be able to navigate through all those things, or it's going to make it a very uphill battle for you to, to be able to work, especially in this industry oh, with yeah. all the type A personalities and, you know, they got strength coaches that are very loud and going to tell you whatever they feel like and they don't care. Yes, yes, yes. And really, Sean, I think that's, that's a big part of it. You, public speaking or doing anything, food service management, anything you're doing, it's like being an athlete. You have to pay your dues, right? You, nobody gets born to be a professional golf player without going out to practice public speaking you say it's not my thing I don't like it do it more and more and more because it will get easier and you can be the first testimony right now you don't even think twice about doing it or now I'm seeking out like I want to try to do yeah. clinics or, or small things where I want to speak in front of people yeah. where, I, where I would have never said that before but so as you glad. become as you become more confident in your skills and what you do and, and you know that the information that you're providing to others is working and then makes those conversations and being put into those situations a lot easier because of the successes maybe that you've had prior with other people. And one other quick thing I want to say too, is not everything that you're going to do for experience again, is going to pay you a lucrative amount. Mm -hmm. And I just want to encourage people to just, grab onto those opportunities, make sure that you're sleeping well, eating right, getting exercise, you feel good enough to take on those little extra projects and those little extra opportunities because it's building your tool set for the ultimate goal. Because because some individuals will take on nothing and expect a lot, or some will take on too much and they don't know how to throttle it back. That's right. And like, I can say like, I was definitely one of those people that like, would throttle it way up here. And, and it took me a lot of experiences kind of going through the field to tell myself, like, I don't have to stay here till seven, eight o'clock at night. Like if, if my work is done, like I can leave at this time yes. or the work's always going to be here tomorrow. 
Like there's nobody chasing me down to make sure it's done. Like at this very moment. So like, you need to calm down, relax, prioritize yourself. And that yeah. stuff's going to get done. Just yeah. keep, keep programming and pushing it to the days that it needs to get done or how far it needs to get done. That's right. Very good. Um, so another question I wanted to ask is, you know, more and more universities are talking about inclusion, diversity. I know obviously in, in dietetics, it's, it's mostly a white female field, yeah. you know, maybe whether it's in your, your position or maybe at other universities, you know, have you seen a shift, especially like in dietetics, nutrition to try to get in more diversity, inclusion, more males, more people of other ethnicities into the program. So we kind of diversify that a little bit more out in the field. And it's such a great subject matter to talk about because without diversity, you're not meet, you're not meeting the needs of a great amount of people in the community, right? So the more you diversify, the better you're doing to keep the, the entire you know, population healthy. So what I always look at is we, rare, we are getting more males in the field now. So that's becoming more and more. We are reaching out to more diverse communities. Um, I would say probably goals of like 15 to 20% of underrepresented students would be a good goal. And think about the community itself. If I have a nutrition related issue, am I gonna pay more attention? Am I gonna relate to somebody that may look like me, act like me, know my food? They know how I eat, right? They can give me tips. They can't, they don't come in and say, now you should just consume this, this, and this. And they they know how I eat and they know how I can make it healthier. So we're really pulling in high school students and we're looking in the communities for people that may be interested in representing their population and getting them healthier because they're often the population that has more nutrition related health issues. Could be some of it is the people aren't relating to the people that are talking to them. Yeah, I think some of those those high schoolers or populations just don't even know like nutrition is an opportunity. They don't even know that like that's that's a job that you could do on a regular basis. Yes. And I 100% agree, like, it's going to be able to be easier to relate to people that are going through similar situations you are, right? Like, I came from a really low economic background. So athletes that have been from a low economic background or had one parent or, or dealt with a lot of those different situations, I can definitely compare and sympathize and be able to have those conversations with them. Versus, you know, I've had athletes that are very high economic, right? Parents have made yeah. millions of dollars, right? And they're... Yes. They're in a totally different environment and lifestyle. And sometimes I can't, you know, understand some of the things they go through or they complain about because I'm like, why are you complaining about that? So it definitely is important to kind of keep, you know, a wide vision, open yeah. ears and listen to the individuals you're talking to, to know how to direct them based off of where they're essentially coming to, you know, in your specific organization. And there are a lot more scholarships. There's a lot more supports out there to help people get through the education that's required. If the time is right, and I think it's exciting, right? I think this is really where we need to be. And we recognize it. That's the greatest thing. I think it takes so many years to recognize there's a problem. Mm -hmm. To be able to fix it, it doesn't happen overnight, but we know we recognize it. So we're making steps to remedy it's just so funny. I mean, you think about nutrition, it's like something bad needs to happen or yes. a large yeah. group or a large amount of people need to say something for actual actions to happen, which it's, it's sad that we have to say that, but in a lot of senses, it seems like it has to come down to those extreme situations for movement in a lot of areas to progress forward, to get it where we need to. And what I love is when I first started in nutrition, well, I always said my office was in the mushroom level. We were always in the basement and we were, we weren't like looked at as essential. And through the years now with public health and people, insurance companies saying, Hey, if we keep our population healthier, our costs are going to go down. So they're, they're making supports and they're reimbursing dietitians at a higher rate. I have seen a big 180 in the significance of how a dietitian is perceived in the healthcare area. 
or even some uh some health insurances are providing like bonuses or special things to yeah. individuals for being healthy which is like that's right it's, it's common sense right if you're doing a great job and you're getting healthier and you're having to spend less spend less money or use your insurance less like yes yeah we're not going to give you a ton of stuff but you should still provide some type of reward for those individuals that are actually doing what they're supposed to at the end of the, i mean and that's like for anybody i mean if we have an athlete that we work with right like i'm going to come over and like tell you, you did a great job keep yeah. it up you know, give positive reinforcement and feedback so that you want to keep coming back for more and keep doing it. Yeah. And workplace health is a big area for dietitians, right? Big companies, some smaller companies realize the significance of keeping their population healthier because they're more productive. So they will hire a dietitian to come in and create programs that will help educate their employees throughout the months and weeks and create those good uh, habits for them. And it's a benefit for the employee. They look at it, wow, I didn't realize I had this service. Even though sometimes my job bumps me, I get something out of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you stand, but I think London did a four day work week. Um, Nike recently gave like everybody off for I think three or four days. And, yeah. you know, companies are starting to see if, if we take care of the people that work for us, it's yeah. going to pay dividends for them to want to work harder for us to then get a better output, which is what everyone wants at the end of the day anyways. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, Dr. And D, I'm go ahead. Excited. I'm excited. One more quick thing about, I tell students that once you get your career, and if it's, even if you're a programmer and you're sitting by a computer, it doesn't mean that you're destined to be unhealthy. Yeah. Once you nutrition courses or you you work with a dietitian you understand what i what tools you need to put in place in your workplace to stay healthy and it's just being an educator to me is the most wonderful thing at the end of the day we're all here to try to help people that's right we can just Absolutely. as long as we're on this earth we can just try to help as many people as we can and hopefully Absolutely. hopefully we help one person that helps another person that kind of spreads beyond that point. And, and that's all we could really ever ask for at the end of the day. Agree. But Dr. D, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, lots of great information on here. Anybody that wants to get in contact with her, we're going to put her information in the bio. We're going to put her contact information. Um, so if you need to reach out to her, if you are a student that has specific questions, um, I'm sure she'd be very open to answer those. Oh, yes. And then anything regarding myself, again, my content information there as well. Um, again, I'm a very open book, willing to Zoom call, phone call, text, whatever it is. Um, I want to try to give back to everyone as much as I can too going forward. Absolutely. I have an open door policy. So any, any way I can help, I'm happy to. And Sean, thank you for this opportunity. It's great. Absolutely. And have a great day, Dr. B. I will. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you.